Good morning and welcome to Morning Scoop for Thursday, June 30th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The Notre Dame game is in 65 days, the game against Michigan in 149 days. We are going to take a little bit of a diversion away from our usual football content to talk a little men's basketball today. Chris Holtman is entering his sixth season, and with a lot of roster turnover, this is one of the more unpredictable Buckeye basketball seasons in recent memory. My guest today, and this is something you probably could have predicted, is Tony Gertham, and he and I do the Buckeye Weekly podcast together. I'm guessing you also knew that already. Tony, thank you for being here. Tom, thanks for having me. That's the first time hearing that we have a podcast together, so uh, great job. Since when? Ooh, 2017 or so. It's only 600 and something episodes. It's not, no big deal. Uh, I mentioned off the top of the show how different this year's roster is going to look for the for Chris Holtman's team. I mean, just to run through it for people, EJ Liddell, Malachi Branham, they are off the NBA. Saw them get drafted last week. Kyle Young is gone. Mari Wheeler, Justin Ahrens, Michi Johnson, Cedric Russell, Joey Brunk, Jimmy Sotos, Harrison Hookfin, all gone. Those guys are all, all off of last year's team and uh, playing somewhere else or going pro in something other than sports. There are five scholarship players returning. It's Justin Sewing, Seth Towns, Zed Key, Eugene Brown, and Kalen Etzler. Now, they're five guys back. However, Etzler redshirted, so he kind of doesn't count. Towns missed the whole season with an injury, so he kind of doesn't count. Suing only played a total of 30 minutes across two games because of injuries. So really, you really only have Key and Brown who played any kind of meaningful time last year. Then they bring in three transfers, five freshmen from what was the sixth best recruiting class in the country. It still feels like you have almost no idea, Tony, who's going to be starting at a majority or maybe even all of the positions by the time Big Ten play starts in January. You're absolutely right. And as you rattled off those names that are no longer on a team, people need to, need to realize you said 10 names from a team that generally in, in college basketball, you're generally allotted 13 scholarships. Obviously, COVID has changed that a little bit, but you are, are a, a much different team. And that's not even including like the, the Utah State transfer who couldn't play last year. You're, it's it's a completely different team. There are some familiar faces, as you said, but this is going to be an unfamiliar team, a, a completely different team than um, than you saw last year. I, for some, that's a good thing. I think there's there's um, it, it is mystery and excitement, and what's the uh, you know, there's a connection there. I think, but uh, concern and mystery. There's also a connection. So it's it's somewhere in the middle there, but I think there's there, there's certainly room for optimism given the the freshman class, but it's you know, it's anybody's guess. Is this is this an elite eight team? Is this an NIT team? Uh, you're probably gonna. I don't know that you have anybody predicting elite eight, but I think you'll have some people that will say this could this team could get into the tournament and, and move and others who will be like i'm not willing to say anything like that the expectations this year are just kind of like the, the old joey bosa shrug emoji just uh, sure yes what, what are the expectations i don't know some maybe possibly because you're right i mean you're the team you're going to get on day one they open with shamanad for an exhibition game and you know who knows what you're going to have then and then by the time you get to March and you have that whole season of development, you could have an entirely different team, not only in terms of player development and, you know, hey, the, the true freshman who wasn't ready to play at the beginning of the year now is, but also in terms of lineup. I mean, you could have, this is, this is a team that probably will not look good for stretches, potentially extended stretches this year. But this is also one of those years where don't necessarily give up on them too early because what you see in November is not what you're going to get in March. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And you know, Malachi Branham is an example of how you can look early on compared to how you look at the end of the season. And when you've got five freshmen, any one of those guys could uh, just take some time, but then also blossom. And they will need some of those guys to play a lot of minutes. And so that will help them grow. And there will be growing pains. And you have the transfers having to find their roles. There's a chance that each one of those guys could be in the starting lineup. And so you know, these are guys that 
have not played together before they're obviously they're practicing and they're doing their workouts together and they're getting some work together where they can but it's completely different to then play games with each other and uh, it's a lot like we talked about with the offensive line gelling you know, the, these the starting five needs to gel and and then figure out the way everybody else plays and then it takes Chris Holtman time to figure out the best lineups, his best five, because the best five, I think, is going to change throughout the season with, with this group. And that's, you expect the transfers to to be kind of the leaders uh, in terms of, um, these are all guys who are former starters, 20-point score for Tanner Holden from Wright State, Sean McNeil from West Virginia, like a 12-point score. Isaac Likely from Oklahoma State, a four-year starter. So you would expect some leadership from those guys. But it's it's Zed Key, it, it's uh, Justice Suing who have been here, Justice Suing, a versatile guy. So the melding of the established Buckeyes, the newest upper-class Buckeyes, and the freshman Buckeyes, uh, it's, there's three different groups here that all have to play as one. And that group uh, is going to be, or those groups, I guess, are going to be playing a very good non-conference schedule, which is kind of the norm under Chris Holtman at Ohio State. But all of the interesting games this year are all away from home. They play Duke at the Big Ten ACC Challenge. That's at Cameron Indoor. You and I, you and I may have to find a way to get uh, get uh, credentialed for that one. Go down to, uh, I've always wanted to cover a game at Cameron Indoor. Might be a good year to try and check that one off the list. Uh, another place I wouldn't mind covering a game. I guess this will be a harder sell with the, uh, site ownership, but uh, the Maui Invitational, wouldn't mind going out there. That's probably going to be a tougher, uh, a tougher uh, ticket, to, uh, ticket to get. Uh, but the bracket isn't out for that one. But the other teams in the field for the Maui Invitational, Arizona, Arkansas, Cincinnati, Creighton, Louisville, San Diego State, and Texas Tech, that's a pretty good field. you got a couple potential top 10 teams in there. And then they'll play, as usual, in the CBS Sports Classic. That's December 17th. And it'll be against either North Carolina, Kentucky, or UCLA. That hasn't officially been announced. We were talking before the show. You said you, you had a pretty good idea who it was going to be. But, I mean, that's a pretty solid slate all around. Yeah, that's a who's who of college basketball. You mentioned the CBS Sports Classic. Uh, college basketball reporter Jeff Goodman said back in May that he was hearing it was North Carolina uh, against Ohio State. So that's uh, another blue blood, baby blue blood. Tar Heel Blue Blood, um, whichever particular Pantone of Blue. But, uh, yeah, you've got Duke, you've got North Carolina, you've got whatever shakes out with Maui and, and those other teams. Now, Tom, if you did want to go cover Maui, I'm just imagining what it would be like because it's, it's Michigan week, which is also Thanksgiving week. And so the, the final game is like the day before Thanksgiving. So I'm imagining your wife, if, if you tell her, like, so I'm I'm going to Hawaii, but don't worry, I'll be back on Thursday, and I'm gonna. It'll be probably around noon when I'll get back from from my flight or whatever. You know, just you slide right in, right in time for uh, lunch or dinner or whatever. Please make sure Thanksgiving dinner's hot. I don't want to. I don't want to have cold if I get. You know, make sure it's make sure it's hot when I get home. Yeah, I've had a long day. That's what I'm going to lead the conversation with. One hundred percent. Yeah, they, nothing nothing else going on in the Ohio State beat that week. So yes, we'll. Uh, Maui, Maui may have to wait for another another year, but uh, yeah, Cameron, Cameron Indoor, we'll have to we'll have to talk about that and see if we can make that happen. So that, those are all fascinating games, potentially a lot of really good matchups all the way from home. Tony, now we get to talk about the home slate, and oh boy, oh boy, um, we're gonna we're gonna play a little game. You are going to guess the highest ranked in the Ken Palm rankings from the previous season of Ohio State's six Division I opponents. I will read down the list, and here's your, here's your hint. Uh, the, uh, there are 358 teams in Division I. So who is the highest ranked out of those 358 teams of these six opponents? And your additional hint is quad, one win, quad four wins, which is the wor- lowest quality win that give you basically no points uh, for your NCAA tournament resume. Playing a team at home, anything anyone ranked below 160 is considered a quad four opponent. So, all right, here we go. Uh, exhibition game against Chaminade, so we can kind of throw that one out. Robert Morris, Charleston Southern, Eastern Illinois, St. Francis of Pennsylvania, Maine, and Alabama A&M. So I'm not going to make you guess which of them was the highest, but I'm going to ask you, 
which of the 358 teams, the one that was the best in the Ken Palm rankings last year, what did that team rank? I'm going to say 279th, and it was Eastern Illinois, with a candlestick. Uh, Eastern Illinois, out of the 358 teams, was 357th. So take that, IUPUI. Uh, no, Tony. 314th. Alabama A&M, 314th out of 358. And that is, Tony, the best. The best of the Ken Palm rankings of the six non-conference home opponents this year. I mean... I guess I kind of get it because you're dealing with so much uncertainty with that team. You need time to figure out things. You don't want to lose it. You know, you don't want to play the number 120 team and, you know, have a, you know, you're, you're figuring things out and you lose a silly one that really hurts you down the line. But I mean, that is also going to be just brutal for not only the atmosphere inside the building, but, you know, in terms of building an NCAA tournament resume, they'd better do it away from home because the home slate's not going to do anything for them. Well, and to be fair, Tom, Ken Pomeroy, this is all just opinion, right? Uh, something like that. It's it's uh, objectively determined mathematically, so that's kind of like an opinion. Uh, there's an opinion that goes into the formula, yes. And, you know, okay, let's let's stipulate. These are, these are last year's results, so that's not this year's team. This is not a predictive thing. But, you know, when you're reading down that list, none of those names are exactly, well, this is a traditional powerhouse who just had one bad year. It's like, mm, I, I think Maine is one of those teams that's never made the NCAA tournament. Like, there's a relatively short list of teams that have never made the NCAA tournament. One of the St. Francis's is on there. It's either Pennsylvania or New York, and I can't remember which one off the top of my head. I believe Maine is on that list. Alabama A&M is a SWAC team, and those are always 16 seeds. Uh, even if you know if they do make the tournament, there's just there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of powerhouses uh, on that roster. Robert Morris is like what 300 years old at this point, so that's he can't be very good at basketball. Yeah, I, granted, th this is not the kind of home schedule that gets the season ticket buyers to like. Oh well, I need to get season tickets that way I can secure and make sure I get the main game. Like that's. That's not one of the things that is going to happen with this ticket. However, you look at when those games are, and the first three are the first three games of the year, and then it, it kind of gets your team ready for or, or allows your team to practice a bunch and play some games before that Maui tournament. So you go and you play three games in Maui. Then you come home and you prepare for a week to play at Duke. And then after that, you've got St. Francis a few days later and then it's finals and then you so you've got like two weeks off and then you play in North Carolina then you've got a few days after that to play Maine and Alabama before Big Ten the 20 game Big Ten season starts so you know where they are placed makes sense but uh and now I'm just imagining these are be, being like 6 30 p.m you know tip-offs where there's going to be 2,700 people in, in Value City Arena at tip-off. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, again, this is, let's let's recognize why the schedule is the way it is. You know, they are playing a lot of quality competition away from home, and you do need games to sort of get this sorted out when you essentially turned over your entire roster. So, yeah, and then, you know, the, the conference schedule itself is, is uh, you know, it, it will be a, st a pretty st uh, stern test as well, and I guess this is this is a logical way to construct your team if, like we said at the beginning, what you have when they get the Big Ten season in the middle of, you know, the, the heart of Big Ten season, end of January, February, heading into March, that team is not what you're seeing in November. So th there are going to be a lot of uh, a lot of games that are not ones that you're talking about to your uh, grandkids uh, on the uh, early season schedule. But, you know, you never you never know what these seasons are going to look like with this many new players, this many question marks. And, you know, I mean, this is this is going to be it's going to be a fascinating Ohio State season just because, like I said before, I, I don't even know what a realistic expectation is. I mean, Chris Holtman has won 20 games every year. Is that a realistic expectation to expect him to win 20 games this year? Or is that completely crazy? Or is that setting the bar way too low? 
that is the bar that you need to be over. And I guess if the expectation is that you need to be over it, then the bar is too low at that point, especially year six, as you said, that can't be, I mean, and playing what is on a schedule 31 games. And you know, a lot of these are automatic wins. So you're asking, like, I don't know, what do you have to be to 12 and eight in big 10 play to secure a 20 win season, something like that. Uh, another aspect to this this home schedule no indiana and no michigan either which is kind of um you know a, a little depressing as well as those are two of the the best rivalries for ohio state you do get a home and home with michigan state which is um which which i guess is nice but uh to have that home schedule and, and no indiana and no michigan that's uh, too bad so there will be uh, there will be plenty to plenty to look forward to with this team. Just I, I always I always like teams where you just you don't have a clue what to expect because sometimes it goes great, sometimes it goes terribly. It's always interesting though. There's always there's always something to talk about when you have no idea what to expect because everything at that point is kind of at least a little bit of a surprise. So we'll see how that one goes. We will be back to uh, you, our usual football coverage on tomorrow's show. Always plenty to talk about. You probably have a better idea what to expect with the Ohio State football team this fall than you do with the basketball team. Uh, and generally, uh, that, is a, uh, that is a good thing. Michigan and, Indi- and Indiana, both on the home schedule for the football team this year. So you have that to look forward to as well. Not necessarily the two biggest games on the schedule this year, but one of, you know, the biggest game and then also Indiana. Uh, also have a couple other games on there that uh, are going to be games of note this fall as well. So we'll have plenty to talk about there. We, um, you uh, may have uh, a little bit of football news coming up later this week. There's a, uh, an announcement commitment announcement that could be coming on Friday, another one potentially coming on Monday. So there's going to be, this could be a busy weekend for Ohio State football and recruiting, uh, recruiting end of things. So we'll be talking about that on the Buckeye Weekly podcast. You can find that where you find this, as well as the Gives in the Bank podcast that Mark Devler and Build the Bank Green do. Big Me kickoff with Kevin Noon around the Oval with Alex Kleitman. You can find them all where you find this. Just search Buckeye Scoop to find them all. You can subscribe right there and leave us a five-star rating and review, which will help other folks find those shows as well. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.